This is going to be why I'm ready for the rapture. Number one, because I'm ready to move on from this old body. Romans 7.24 says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus Christ is the deliverer. He has delivered us from the wrath to come. He delivered us from the power of darkness. He delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. And he is going to deliver us from the body of this death. If you're a Christian, then you're walking around with a live spirit inside of a dead corpse. And one day, at the translation or the rapture, we will move on from the old body. I'm ready to move on from sin, from temptation, from weakness, fears, worries, sleep deprivation, stress, anxiety, depression, and all those horrible words and things that are associated with this old body. This dead body we are walking around in will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. If you look at John eleven forty three and 44, it's talking about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And it says, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. So Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus was bound hand and foot with grave clothes. The dead in Christ at the rapture are going to be the same way, but they are going to be changed. And their soul is coming down from heaven with Jesus Christ, and it is going to meet their body and change into a glorified body. If you are alive at the rapture, you may not be bound hand and foot with grave clothes, but you're walking around in something that is ready for the grave. And Jesus Christ is going to say to that body, Loose him and let him go. And the old body is going to be changed, and you're no longer going to experience backaches and headaches and arthritis and stomach viruses or any bad thing is associated with the old body. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty through 52 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning we won't all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the dead are going to get up out of the graves, out of wherever their dead bodies have been sprinkled or buried or hidden, and all the missing kids and people that have been buried somewhere, uh, where, where they were taken by wicked men and murdered and buried, even their bodies are going to come up. God knows where that those wicked men hid their bodies in the ground. And the people who died at sea and their bodies that are in the water, if they're saved, their bodies are going to come up. All of the people who have been cremated, their bodies are going to come back together and be changed. 1 Corinthians 15.53 says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The corruptible, the dead in Christ, whose bodies have seen corruption, will put on incorruption. Jonah said the Lord brought up his life from corruption. And that's what happens to the body of the dead in Christ. It is brought up from corruption. Then the mortal puts on immortality. Those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will move on from this mortal body and it will be changed to an immortal body. 1 Corinthians 15.54 says, When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Uh, death takes a beating in the Bible. Revelation 21.4 lets us know that one day there will be no more death. If death is an actual person, the devil is going to be real mad at him at the rapture. First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty five says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. He made a show of the principalities and powers and triumphed over them. And Second Corinthians two fourteen says, We triumph in Christ. Romans eight thirty seven says, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how Jesus Christ and the saints are associated with words like triumph and conquering and victory. 
And this is because we are winners. Either way, no matter what happens, everything bad down here can am amount to what we will get in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of a man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If you are born again, then nothing you go through down here can compare with what's waiting on you over there. If you're saved, then God sees you as perfect spiritually as Jesus Christ because when he sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You had the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed to you the moment you believe the gospel. And this old body that needs changing still has sin and it still needs to be redeemed. And what we are waiting for at the rapture is the redemption of our body. We've already been redeemed, but our body hasn't. When you got saved, your flesh wasn't born again. Romans 8.23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. You know that sin that you fight off daily? You won't have to worry about it anymore. You'll no longer have to reckon your flesh as dead. You'll be alive all over. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear, appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Philippians three twenty one, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is, able, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We are going to have a body like the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture. His body can walk through shut doors, as it does in the Bible, travel through space faster than the speed of light, as he did in the Bible, eat and not just have to dispose of what we eat, as Jesus Christ did in the Bible. All the things he did... And his glorified body will be able to do in our glorified body. Because we're going to have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. But next, I'm ready for the rapture because I'm ready not only to move on from the old body, but I'm ready to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Lost people have no hope. They aren't looking forward to meeting the Lord. They're looking forward to new movies and new music and new video games and new cars. They have their affection on things down here. Things that don't satisfy because the eyes of man are never satisfied. So hell is never full. And if you're saved, then you hope. Your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The hope is a sure thing. I'm not saying it like I hope Jesus is coming back. He's my hope because I know he's coming back to get me. And I know that I'm going to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Paul believed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he believed in the deity of Christ. Because he couldn't have rose from the dead unless he was God manifested in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God, and that's why he rose from the dead. But those who sleep in Jesus, those who are dead and saved, that is, will God bring with him, meaning he is bringing their souls with him in the air to meet their bodies that are going to come up out of the grave. See, when you die, your body goes to the grave, your spirit goes back to God, saved or lost, and your soul either goes to hell if you're lost or heaven if you're saved. And the souls of those people that are dead in Christ are coming down from heaven with Jesus and their bodies are going to come up out of the grave and they're going to meet and their bodies are going to be changed. This is where we will all meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. We will see saved loved ones that have passed on and we will know them in their glorified bodies. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We aren't going to prevent them which are asleep, meaning we aren't going to go up before the dead in Christ go up. 1 Thessalonians 
through 18 says, For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is a comfort to know that you are not going to go through the wrath of God. It's a comfort to know you'll see your dead child again, you'll see your mother again, and everyone in the body of Christ will get along finally. We are all members of the same body, but people down here get in fights and break fellowship and begin to hate each other. But at the rapture, when we meet Jesus Christ, we will have unity in Jesus Christ. We'll all speak the same thing. We'll all have the right doctrine. Nobody will be saying, I don't fellowship with him because he believes this or because he believes that. Or I don't fellowship with him because he's been divorced and remarried. Everyone will have the right word of God. And we'll find out who was right down here. And we won't be sad about it. We'll rejoice in knowing the truth, even though we might not have been the ones that had the truth on a certain topic. We'll re rejoice in just knowing what's right and what was wrong and we will meet the lord in the air song of solomon chapter 2 and verse 10 says my beloved spake and said unto me rise up my love my fair one and come away uh, you're not going to have to go through the time of jacob's trouble he's going to say rise up my love my fair one and come away when you meet the lord in the air first thessalonians 5 9 says for god hath not appointed us to wrath up to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be safe from wrath through him. Titus 2, 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the seals. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, because Jesus Christ is coming to pick me up before it starts. I'm not appointed to wrath. Well, you say the wrath of God is the last three and a half years and not the first three and a half years. Then why is it that the Lamb opens the first seal? If the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, opens the first seal, then how is the first three and a half years not the wrath of God? But number three, I'm ready for the rapture because that means I've made it to heaven. Revelation 4 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation 4 shows us a good picture of the rapture of the church. John, who is a type of the bride of the Christ in, in the Bible, is called up to the third heaven. A door was opened, and something picked him up and showed him some things. And at the rapture, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to pick me up and show me some things. He's going to take me to the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to be judged for my service and lack thereof, and I'm supposed to have my mind on these things right now. The Bible talks about, think on these things, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest, of good report, and so on. Think on these things. It says in Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Matthew six nineteen through 20, it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm ready for the rapture because I'm ready to make it to heaven. I'm sick of sin. I'm sick of this world. I'm sick of going to work. I'm sick of having to be sick of going to work. And when you get in the Bible and you start setting your affection on things above, this world doesn't look good anymore. If you've been saved long, then you have found out you really don't fit in in this world. Why would you want to stay in this world? Uh, John fifteen nineteen says, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore... The world hateth you. First John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. First John 3.1 Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So a Christian who fits in with this world's activities is acting like an enemy of God. They are like Peter, acting like they don't know Jesus when they really do know Jesus. But I'm ready for the rapture because I'm ready to make it to heaven. I'm ready to leave this present evil world. And next I'm ready for the rapture because I'm ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, nine says, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So I'm looking forward to eating with Jesus Christ after I meet him. After we go through the judgment seat of Christ and get all of that stuff sorted out, we will eat with Jesus Christ. We'll eat and not get fat. We won't have to dispose of the food. And reading the Bible, God has always fed his people in the Bible. He fed Israel with manna in the wilderness. The angel of the Lord gave Elijah some cake in 1 Kings 19.6. In 1 Kings 17, the ravens brought bread and flesh in the morning and the evening to Elijah. And that's a picture of God using the devil to feed his kids because ravens in the Bible picture unclean spirits. And most of us are working for wicked men in factories and wherever else. And those wicked men use that money to do wicked stuff. But yet they're also paying us to work for them. Uh, God will have a way to feed his kids. Uh, Psalms 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Luke twelve twenty nine through 31 says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat, nor or, uh, what ye shall drink. Neither be ye doubtful, be ye of doubtful mind, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. God always feeds us here, and then he'll feed us when we get up there. Sure, there's some Christians in the world that are starving, but he's feeding them somehow or they wouldn't still be here. And if they starve to death, then they go be with him. And they won't be starving anymore. It may not seem good to die, but it is better. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth, as the Bible says. You win either way if you're saved. And God doesn't just feed us food. He feeds us the Word of God. Maybe the marriage supper of the Lamb is a big feast on the Word of God taught by Jesus Christ Himself. Maybe He will open up to us the Scriptures like He did to the disciples when they didn't understand the prophecies about him. The Bible talks about the word of God and being associated with food. Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Psalms 119, 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. But I'm ready for the rapture. And if you're not saved then you're not ready for the rapture. But Paul gives us the clear gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is that Jesus Christ died. He died for you. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you want to be saved, you need to believe on that to get you to heaven. Put your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin. Jesus Christ died for sins. Why? Because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus Christ had to die because of you and your sin. You are a guilty sinner. 
and you deserve to go to hell for your sin. But Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You are the ungodly. You are a sinner. Colossians 1, 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So if you want forgiveness of sins, you don't get it through living right and trying to make up for it. You get it through his blood. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for sins. How did he die? He died by shedding his blood. There had to be a blood sacrifice for your sins. Somebody had to die because of the bad things that you did. And the only person that could be the perfect sacrifice was the Lord Jesus Christ because he was sinless. He had no sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And if you want to be saved, you need to realize you're a sinner. You need to realize why you need a Savior. And you need to come to the Savior as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on him. Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice that word, whosoever. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how horrible the sin is, if you know you're a sinner, you know you're going to hell and you desire to be saved, God will save you. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 16.31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You say, So what do I do? Do I call on him or do I believe him? Well, you're probably not going to call on Jesus Christ to save you unless, you're gonna, unless you believe that he's going to save you. Somebody said, well, I'm against a sinner's prayer. You're not saved by praying a prayer. Before you even pray the prayer, you've believed in your heart to salvation if you meant what you're, what you're saying. I mean, if you truly, if you come to Jesus Christ and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. Please save me. I know that you died for me. I know that you died for my sin and you were buried and rose again the third day, and I'm putting my trust in you to save me. Before those words even came out of your mouth, you already believed in your heart to salvation. All those people arguing over, you need to pray a prayer versus not praying a prayer, they're just making it hard on people that are having a hard time understanding salvation. But all you have to do to be saved, come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner that you are, and believe on Him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. And you need to do that before it's too late because the rapture could happen at any moment. And you need to be ready for the rapture. You need to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you're not saved, you're not looking for Jesus Christ because you're not ready, you're unprepared. And if Jesus Christ was to come back right now, then you would be left here to go through the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. But I hope you will believe the gospel before it's too late.